teaching. And we know that next day is 25 years. Right. And so today, this is a very, very important session. We think we have come a long way in the sub-region, but I'm sure that we are going to find that we still have a very long way to go. And so this time, I'm going to turn you over to our moderator. I can get talking about this and be here for the rest of the day. <laughs> but women in the region demand better. We are still being told we can't be raped by our husbands. We are still being told we need somebody's permission for ligation. So we have a long way to go. So let's give Ms. Black's talk our undivided attention. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'll just follow the protocol that was established earlier and just to dive right into this very interesting, has been said to be problematic and contentious, but we will all agree that it is sexy. Yes? <laughs> yes, it is sexy. So I'll be looking at comprehensive sexuality education, charting the way forward in the Caribbean. Let us establish firstly what is comprehensive sexuality education. It's a curriculum based process of teaching and learning about the cognitive, emotional, physical and social aspects of sexuality. It aims to equip children and young people with knowledge, skills, attitudes and values that will empower them to realize their health, well-being and dignity, develop respectful social and sexual relationships consider how their choices affect their own well-being and that of others, and understand and ensure the protection of their rights throughout their lives. Comprehensive sexuality education is delivered in formal and non-formal educational settings. It is said to be scientifically accurate. It is said to be scientifically accurate taught in incremental stages, age and developmentally appropriate, curriculum based, comprehensive, based on a human rights approach, based on gender equality, culturally relevant and contextually appropriate, transformative, and able to develop life skills needed to support healthy choices. I wanted to share with you as well that in 2009, the first international technical guidelines for CSE were developed as a joint UN initiative following a rigorous set of assessments of over 87 studies that were conducted on comprehensive sexuality education. 47 countries were apart from the developing world were a part of that assessment that was done. And they really wanted to see how CSE could have an impact on adolescent health. There were also technical consultations with experts and key stakeholders, including parents. And so we can understand that parents do have a huge role to play in comprehensive sexuality education. And so their perspectives and concerns um, were factored into the assessment that was done. The international guidance was renamed the UN International Technical Guidance it was published in 2018, and what it did was to bring additional evidence to the issue of CSC, and it included young people and technical experts. In 2014, UNFPA produced its own operational guidelines for CSC, but with a focus on gender and human rights. It is a human right. Comprehensive sexuality is a right, and it's a part of education, the right to education and also health. It is included in several international frameworks and agreements, including the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and also SDGs, Goals 3 and 5. UNFPA's own 1994 International Conference on Population and Development also speaks explicitly on comprehensive sexuality education and calls on governments to ensure that this is provided to young people for their well-being and health. 
Of note as well is the Global Strategy for Women's, Children's, and Adolescent Health, 2016 to 2030, and the call is the same. There are other international frameworks, but I will not name them. Some of them were actually named from yesterday's session, but I wanted to flag these three that we have. The question, why do young people need comprehensive sexuality education? And it's simply because it prepares them for a safe, productive, fulfilling life in a world where we have many challenges that they face. Our own Alison Drayton, she covered and shared quite a bit of statistics on the issues. And so I will not go in depth in that, but just to highlight a few key ones. We have the early and unintended pregnancies in the Caribbean. We have HIV and other STIs. We have issues with gender-based violence and gender equality, and these continue to pose a risk to young people. We also see that CSC presents a positive approach to sexuality education, emphasizing values such as respect, acceptance, tolerance, non-discrimination, equality, empathy, responsibility, and reciprocity. CSC also provides age-appropriate and phased education about human rights, gender equality, relationships, reproduction, sexual behavior risks, and prevention of ill health. To go in depth on why young people need CSC, it's because key sexual and reproductive health issues can be addressed through that framework. We have puberty, pregnancy, access to contraception. We have the issue of violence previously mentioned, including GBV, abortion, safe and unsafe, HIV, and other STIs. Again, we see that there are other issues that young people face that have real interactions, interlinkages, synergies um, with comprehensive sexuality education. So we have issues around poor mental and emotional health. We have alcohol, tobacco, and drug use and abuse. We also have the influence of ICT on sexual behavior. We know that that is a real thing in the Caribbean. Then we also have subgroups of young people. We have young people living with HIV. We have those young people living in poverty because as was said earlier, those who are maybe middle, upper class, they have options and they're able to do what they want. But young people living in poverty um, do need to have this information so as not to perpetuate a cycle um, of um, poverty. We have young people with disabilities. I know there's a tendency to think that persons with disabilities don't engage in sexual relations, but that's not correct. And so it's important that young people with disabilities, that they also have this information. The LGBTQI young people, they also need to have this information, and also young people affected by humanitarian crisis. What does the global evidence say about CSA? And this evidence really came out of the assessments that were done. And so one, it's, it has positive effects. It improves young people's knowledge and attitudes on sexual and reproductive health and behavior. It actually does not increase sexual activity, sexual risk-taking behavior, or STI, HIV, infection rates. Note this one. Abstinence-only programs are not effective in delaying sexual initiation reducing frequency of sex or reducing number of sexual partners. So you, we could preach all we want. It doesn't affect the price of rights, as I say sometimes. Gender-focused uh, programs are substantially more effective than gender-blind programs in achieving health outcomes, reducing unintended pregnancy or STIs. Programs that are comprehensive and delivered fully are more likely to have the desired positive impact on young people's health and outcomes. Sexuality education is most impactful, however, when school-based programs are complemented 
with non-discriminatory youth-friendly services and active parental engagement. Let's talk about some of the common misconceptions we have about CAC. One, CAC leads to early sexual initiation. The data and evidence um, suggest that CAC does not lead to early initiation or more sex. It leads to delayed initiation and increased responsible sexual behavior because young people have the information and so they're now able to choose wisely and make um, the correct choices. CSC, another misconception is that CSC deprives children of their innocence. The evidence shows that children actually benefit from scientifically accurate, not judgmental and age and developmentally appropriate information through formal schooling. This is against the backdrop, as was mentioned yesterday, that the early, early sexual debut in the Caribbean is a reality and 56% of girls and 79% of boys on average have had sex before the age of 14. This is from WHO's Global School Based Health Student Health Survey. We also know that almost half of the Caribbean young people ages 15 to 24 do not have adequate information about HIV. This is from a UNAIDS and PANCAP 2018 report. We also know that about two in five young people ages 15 to 24 did not use condoms the last time they had sex. Another UNAIDS and PANCAP report. This information came out in the presentation yesterday, which will be shared. So the point to this is CSC does not lead to early sexual initiation. It does not deprive children of their innocence. And it, there is a misconception that CSC goes against our culture or religion. CSC programs should be built, should build support among the custodians of culture in order to adapt context to the local cultural, cultural context while also addressing negative social norms and harmful practices that are not in line um, with human rights. The key point here is that uh, CSC is culturally specific and contextually specific. And the main point is that whatever happens around CAC programs, they should not reinforce negative social and harmful practices. Another misconception is that parents will object to sexuality education being taught in school. CAC programs are meant to work in partnership with involve and support parents. So it really should be done in consultation um, with parents. Some more misconceptions about CAC. Teaching CAC is too difficult for teachers. Most teachers can be trained in CAC, as is currently included in national curriculum. CAC is already covered in other subjects, biology, life skills, or civics education, and so there is no need to have a standalone CAC program. However, effective CAC covers a comprehensive set of topics, attitudinal and skills-based learning outcomes, which may not necessarily be included in other subjects. Another misconception, young people already know everything that there is to know about sex and sexuality through the internet and social media. Online media doesn't necessarily provide age-appropriate, evidence-based facts CAC offers people, young people a healthy space for discussion. Final misconception, CAC is a means of recruiting young people to alternative lifestyles. That is not so. CAC does not endorse or campaign for any particular lifestyle other than promoting health and well-being for all without judgment on sexual behavior, on sexual orientation, on gender identity, or health status. How is CSC implemented in the Caribbean? It's implemented through, we know we have the HFLE uh, curriculum. CSC 
pregnancy is primarily delivered through the health, the sexuality and sexual health component of the HFLE program. This program came out of CARICOM's regional response in 1994 to negative sexual health outcomes that were being seen in adolescents, including high teenage pregnancy. It is implemented at different levels, quality, and consistency across the Caribbean in an effort to have, provide some more evidence for the efficiency, effectiveness of CAC implementation UNFPA commissioned a state-of-the-art diagnosis on implementation of HFLE in 2017. I will share with you some of the findings. This state-of-the-art diagnosis was done in eight countries. i just read them for you. So we have Belize, we have Jamaica, we have St. Lucia, Grenada, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, and Suriname. What the study sought to do was to determine how CSC is being implemented in the Caribbean, the delivery, mode of delivery, and level of coverage. It also sought to determine perception of CSC performance, issues and determinants, challenges to effective implementation, and the extent to which the program implementation standards were being adhered to in schools. In terms of achievements and accomplishments that were noted by the countries, most of them said that the implementation of the sexuality and sexual health component had moderate coverage. So there was some coverage to that. Most of the countries also utilized a modified approach uh, and selective versions of the CARICOM HFLE guidelines. And this goes back to the point I was making that you're able to contextualize um, the, HF, the, the HFLE um, curriculum based on the national context. And so what the countries have said is that they have been using different versions, their own um, version of the HFLE um, based on the CARICOM HFLE guidelines. They also mentioned that gender-sensitive and rights-based approaches Standards were used in relation to the program design and the development. To be noted, however, with the exception of Suriname, most of the countries have a defined structure with responsibilities for delivering CAC in country. They also noted that we, had, we have several policy frameworks um, that assisted in moving HFLE forward. They mentioned the ICPD program of action. To note as well is the regional ICPD framework, which is the Montevideo Consensus on Population and Development, which has substantive information on CSE. They also noted the Mexico Declaration and how important those frameworks were for ensuring that CSE is being implemented at country level. Two other achievements, accomplishments noted, that there is effort towards um, adherence to CSE standards, and there is some evidence of monitoring from education policy planning and programming units and administrative structures at primary and secondary schools. So those were the achievements and accomplishments noted. Challenges are many, as most of us know. One is that many of the countries felt that they, I mean, they were unsure if the objectives were being met, citing lack of evidence and information to determine achievements. They also pointed to the lack of policy and legislative framework and weak stakeholder buy-in. They mentioned issues of weak leadership, lack of adequate coverage. So there is some coverage, but it was not a comprehensive coverage and the need for stronger partnerships. They mentioned that stakeholders' roles and responsibilities were not always clearly uh, defined. Then we go on to the point about the comfort level of the teachers in teaching CSC in accordance with the standards, and it was noted that there are limited opportunities for training and capacity building. A lack of emphasis on systems and influence and conflicts presented by the socioeconomic environment, 
limited involvement of parents and wider community, lack of systematic approach to youth participation and engagement, and lack of a structured communication strategy. It was felt uh, that there is limited dialogue with opposing groups, particularly faith-based organizations. In June 20, what you're seeing here is a photo from the high-level policy dialogue on CSC in HFLE that was held in Trinidad last year um, in June. And it was a collaboration between PANCAP, UNICEF, UNAIDS, UNESCO, and PAHO to discuss the status of CSC implementation in the Caribbean and to see what the opportunities are to improve quality delivery on the program region-wide. The meeting concluded with 36 recommendations which are expected to be presented to CARICOM COSAD and education for implementation. I won't go through the 36 recommendations. I know you will appreciate that. Uh, but I will just point out that there are five thematic areas and highlight just a couple of the recommendations. The first recommendation, the heading, um, policy and governance, capacity building and program management, knowledge management and strategic information, monitoring and evaluation, multi-sectoral, intersectoral, and community collaboration. On the policy and governance, it was felt that there needed to be a regional model education sector plan that integrates HFLE for adoption by countries to advance the consistency and sustainability of HFLE, both implementation and program delivery. Under knowledge management and strategic information is to review existing frameworks to consolidate policies on HFLE and CSC. Given the economic dimensions um, that, that has been coming up between yesterday and today from the presentations, it's important to do a, a cost analysis of the benefits of implementing the HFLE program, engaging the different partners. On the capacity building and program management is to develop a solid teacher training program and curricula for pre-service and in-service teachers that is culturally relevant and gender sensitive with a competency-based certification for teachers. Another point under that is to develop HFLE as an area of specialization in teacher training institutions. Now, we've noted the concerns by Dr. Um, Deshaun yesterday about maybe some of the discrimination the teachers face when they are, I think, maybe just tasked with teaching HFLE, but this came out as a strong recommendation from the countries that we do have the specialization of teachers in this particular area. Under monitoring and evaluation, it is to develop and support the operation of a robust ME ME system to ask to assess the process, outcomes, and impact of the HFLE program, review the national HFLE programs, engaging a wide variety of stakeholders, review, timely reviews of the regional documents, um, guiding the HFLE program, and to include that in the CARICOM regional framework. Now, as part of the next steps, you, UNFP has been actively supporting this area. And so the plan is, from the recommendations coming out of the Trinidad meeting, is to have a further technical meeting um, to look at how we can develop an implementation plan to advance on the recommendations that were made. It was also mentioned yesterday that we are working with the Ministry of Education in Grenada on a CAC pilot and we expect to have the findings from that in a year's time, and we're hoping that it could be the basis for South-South exchange, you know, identifying best practices, and seeing how other countries in the Caribbean could advance on CAC and HFLE implementation. We all have questions. I know you have questions for me, and I also have questions for you, so I'll go first. And, I mean, I will just say that we, we have key questions because this is something we're actively working on. It's a work in progress. There are still challenges. 
uh, what is the status of CAC implementation in your country? Uh, is there sufficient understanding of the factors that influence um, HFLE program effectiveness and, and efficiency? Um, what prioritized actions must be taken at regional and national levels to improve the results of the HFLE program? And then how can we, as uh, an IDP um, and regional agencies, support partners and countries to prioritize these actions? And so that's the end of my presentation. I will end by saying, if we close our eyes to facts, we will learn through accidents, and it's important for us to minimize or eliminate that as best as possible. Thank you. <laughs> is in the schools now with HFLE because I am not in the school system, but I did teach FLE at HFLE at one point in the high school. And what I found then was that there are children whose schedules are so crowded with everything else that they never got an opportunity to do HFLE. And I hope that that has changed because this should be an across the board um, area of study. In addition, I think that our teenage pregnancy in St. and Nevis is trending downwards since the inception of HFLE in our schools and since the support of teen mothers became a national priority. And so I, I feel that we are positioned now to take this to another level. We realize that we have gotten positive results in these two areas supporting teen mothers because there was that perception that they coming back to school would be a contagion for the other people and other girls at school and that HFLE will make children um, precocious and the research is showing that a lot of our young people are sexually involved and as you said um, Ms. Blackstock the abstinence only we are church people, we are very, <laughs> very religious, but we know that our young people, a lot of them are experimenting. So we do need to give HFLE the support it needs to realize the outcomes that we anticipate. Now the floor is open. I took the prerogative as the moderator to get my five cents in first. So now the floor is open. <laughs> Shirley Wilkes, Guidance Counselor, Gingerland Secondary, Health Educator. As Mrs. Charles Gums, things haven't changed in terms of HFLE in Gingerland Secondary. I don't know about Charlestown. None in Charlestown. Okay. None in Charlestown. Gingerland Secondary, HFLE is placed on the program as a fill up for the A3s. So you will find that first, second, and third. Um, have HFLE, the A3s. That's when they have two sessions per week. For the others, it's just one session of counseling. And so you have to use that one session per week to do anything that has to do with sexual activity, healthy eating, those kind of things. Right now, the fourth and the fifth, they have one period, but especially fifth right now, because they are so concerned about um, SBAs and stuff, they really sometimes don't get any chance of doing it. But what we do know is that when they do get talking about sexual activity, every other section, every other subject takes second place. Even if the math teacher is waiting upstairs for them, they have to finish their sexual education. And so sometimes it go on into two periods. So they crave for it. 
they crave for it. But we do not have enough time because of so many other things we have to do and all the subjects for fourth and fifth. I really think we should have at least two periods per week for each of the classes. Good afternoon. My name is Rochelle Duncan. Um, just a small comment on the first question that you had in your presentation. I believe, just an opinion from another jurisdiction. I know in Jamaica, um, HFLE is, it was introduced in a number of primary schools, but I believe one of the key issues that teachers are having is more or so a capacity building issue. I am not certain that they have sufficient training before they actually begin teaching the HFLE classes. So I believe that that's an area that can be improved the in terms of capacity building. Thank you. That's a very, that's a very interesting comment because just last year, December, we had a capacity building activity in Jamaica. Uh, like a large number of teachers getting the training on HFLE. We have developed quite a number of guidelines, manuals, tools that are being used. In fact, we consider Jamaica to be the standard for HFLE implementation to the point that we are actively working on having a South-South with Grenada. That being said, we still know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done. Capacity building is something that we will continue to look at and to do, not just for Jamaica, but for, for the Caribbean broadly. Thank you. Tricia Daniel, um, just a couple of things. We live in a community where um, the Nivision community is a very private community. So while everyone is aware that sexual activity is happening, we don't ever talk about it. And so it's going to create a level of discomfort for the teachers, and it's also going to create a level of discomfort for the parents, because some parents want the opportunity to educate their children. Like, I want to be able to educate my child, and I want to be able to decide at what point what they're exposed to. So this is where you're going to be able to, you're going to have to be in partnership with the parents, so that when it is, when you have to enforce it in the school, let's say, you don't get that level of opposition from the parents because if I don't think it's appropriate for my child level, I will storm the school, right? I will do that because I have my stages for my children, what I will expose them to. And if I'm forced into thinking I have to expose them to this, it's going to be a challenge. And so in our society, I think it's right across the board, it's going to be a challenge because we do not talk about sex. Anybody you mentioned the word sex to, are they... Or uh, they say to you, you see a level of shame or fear or they, they want the world to open up. And it goes from children to married couples. Everybody pretend that it's not happening. So having an HFLE program is going to be a challenge here in our society. I mean, I agree with you to a, a large extent in that um, parent engagement is key to moving HFLE. I'm just wondering the extent to which, I'm just wondering the extent to which parents are monitoring like social media engagement and the exposure um, around sex and sexuality that the children, yes. Thank you. What I was saying is that I agree with you to a large extent that parent engagement is critical 
to moving HFLE. And I'm just wondering at the same time, the extent to which parents are actively monitoring the activities of the children on social media around sex and sexuality. And uh, I think that may be also something to look at because the information is not just going to come through HFLE, it's also going to come through interactions with the larger society. Mm -hmm. A question over here, I believe. And one over here, sorry, please. Just uh, a few general comments. Um, I was very, my name is Mervyn Thompson, and I am representing the St. Kitts National Youth Parliament Association, or SCNIPA. And it was shocking to me just now that HFLE is not being taught in some schools right here in the Federation. Um, I'd like to think that I'm still young. I left school a few years ago. So I guess I'm privileged to have had HFLE from first form to fourth, fifth. Um, I think that it is something that could be introduced in, I guess, primary schools. As you said, it would be difficult, but I think that this is something that we have to get comfortable speaking to each other about. And um, Dr. Nisbet said, individual action is important. Well, paraphrased. And I think that topics such as these, and even anything generally, is something that sh we should all discuss in our homes because Ms. Daniel, while you want, to, um, you want to say when your children learn certain things, the outside world doesn't care about that. So they are already exposed to it. So it's just for you. It's just for you to, I guess, um, help them to navigate the different circumstances and different situations that are possible to arise in their lives. And that's just my two cents. All right, we have over here and then over in the far corner and then one over here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, dear. <laughs> Denise, I wonder if you can, uh, if you have an opinion on the, uh, you know, there's been a bit of a discussion, should it be integrated into um, teachers' current responsibilities or the, the pluses of having a separate cohort? Because as I, I listen to the presentation and think of some of the discussions, um, the issue of standardization might be helpful. And then um, building on the, the comment just before me, to also keep in mind, and I don't think this was um, such an issue when they were developing the guidelines, um, the, the need to incorporate into the curricula issues around social media. Um, young people post a lot, and um, I'm sure when you're 13 or 9, or actually even 23 these days, you forget that these days... Um, employers and everybody else Google madly before they make the decision. And I don't know about anybody else in the room, but my frontal lobe was certainly not developed enough to be thinking 20 years down the line on consequences of some of these things. And I, I think it's, it's, it's possibly something that isn't in the uh, curricular guidelines. But I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Good morning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. I am Sasti Lewis Clark. I'm representing Current Speech Rye Bryan College. Okay. Um, I hear a lot of comments about um, health education, uh, sorry, sexual, CSE, in high school, but uh, we are forgetting it starts from a primary school level. Children, at, young women at the age of eight are already seeing their menses and are confused and not knowing exactly what it is. And some mothers will not go into details with them about it. They will just give them a sanitary napkin and say, use that. So they don't know what's going on with their body. And we must remember, once a young lady goes through her menses, her hormones begin to range. 
as she would want to have sex, she would start to see guys, and she's like, oh, I like to see him, he's cute. And they do, at that age, start to admire the other sex because their hormone levels are now going up. So education should not just be focused on a high school level. They should start to introduce it in a primary school level at, from the grade three to six. Yes, it might sound that I am being a little bit too out there, but okay. it is better to start it from grade three to, to grade six so they can have an idea of what their body is going through. They need to know about sex. Children get curious if you don't tell them about it. Because another parent will go home and educate their child, and the child will come to school, and they're going to talk about it. And now you're going to, the next child will go home and try to ask mommy about it. Mommy, I don't want to talk about it. The child now will go on the internet, because trust me, they know what they want, and they know how to spell things when they want to look for it. <laughs> and they are going to type it in, and they are going to find out what it is. So would you want the internet to teach your child or would you want you, the parent, and the teachers to come together and teach the child about sexual activity? The more they know, the less pregnancies, the less sexually transmitted infections, and the less outbreak of HIV will happen. You have to start from a very young age. You can't say, oh, let's wait till they go to high school. No, you cannot. And that is where we have to begin. We have to implement the education from a grade three or primary school level. Let the children know. There's no more time for hiding. When they go on the road and they see people dress a certain way, they see, now we have the LGBTQ, uh, I, I'm not, sorry, LGBTI going on. Young men are going to be curious, like, why are they dressed like that? And they might, you know, like to see it. So it's good to educate the children and stop wasting time. We don't have time to waste anymore introduce the topic a pleasant good afternoon to everyone i am mrs paul z wilkin immediate past principal education officer and i just want to um make a few pointers um towards the discussion here today as immediate past education officer HFLE is being taught in the primary schools in Nevis as well as in St. Kitts. We do HFLE. We do an early intervention in the preschools. Good touch, bad touch, those kinds of things. The health promotion unit, they come in and they assist with those sessions. However, we do have some concerns with our teachers in the primary school in terms of some of the topics. Some of our teachers do not feel comfortable with some of the topics. So we have been doing training. Additionally, in Nevis, we have a guidance counselor in each primary school. And our guidance counselors have been doing those topics which are feared by the teachers. It's a team approach. The guidance counselors work along with the teachers to do those sessions. However, I am a bit disappointed that we do not have representation from the Department or Ministry of Education because it is very important that we continue that, make the links and we, we continue the, the partnership between the ministries and the Department of Education. We should not be working in isolation. We must do an overall holistic approach to everything that we are going to do. But... It is being done, HFLE. Maybe not so much of the sexual part of it. And at the same time, you do the teachable moments. When you go with the children and you deal with those issues that I can say for the Department of Education, Nevis, and to a lesser extent, 
St. Kitts. St. Kitts does the HFLE, but with the teachers. And we do training together. Thank you. All right, we can just take one more question, I believe, and then we do have to, to wrap it up. Well, I think, oh, Renaldon Bartlett, Office of the Leader of the Opposition, Nevis. I think the question is for everybody, at what age do we start speaking to them? Because it seems like in Nevis, and in other countries too, so I wouldn't put it just in Nevis, we don't want to accept the fact that people like sex. I would go as far as saying, just like other animals, it drives us. Whether you're a professional, or you're a DJ, or whatever you, you're into, or you think about it every day or once a week, there is some time where the hormones will take over. Sometimes to a point where you didn't intend, but when you're done, you say, Lord, I didn't have to do that. But it is the truth. I can share an experience as a teacher, a primary school teacher, I was teaching for a year. And we seem to tackle it from a point that when we start talking about sex, we have to start talking about the action, the penetration. I want to highlight the hormonal side. We seem to forget that the hormones just don't pop in full force in one moment. I was a computer teacher. My computer lab was more on the outskirts of the school. Now, when I started teaching, I, the other computer teacher was a lady. Now, why are all of a sudden, when I was hired, the young schoolgirls are coming? Now, I'll tell you, they weren't troubling me. They weren't putting no kind of um, adult talk to me but they wanted to be around me. So the hormones are there. They do not know what they're feeling. So somebody has to tell them. So the other point is, as, as a teacher, even in computer, once it is not maths, English, or the other, and if you go to high school, the, the, the ones that you're going to do for CXC, you're placed on the back burner. And then on that same point, School systems are teaching us subjects and not about life. So how do we now combat all of that? We will have to speak to the parents and the parents will have to accept reality. So it would have to be a consensus to the parents to say what age. So you know that boy in grade six, just drawing a reference, they're going to start talking about so and so. So I have to tell them first. You know, so I think that would finalize. I listened to everybody speak and I said, this would be my contribution. So it's a question and comment, more so of a comment. Thank you. Okay, one last very brief comment. We cannot wait until grade three or stuff like that to even start to talk to children. Health promotion unit started in, I think it was 2008, because I was at preschool, to go to the schools with puppet shows, and we were doing good touch, bad touch, because people, adults, pedophiles, they mold children. So if you wait until grade three, when somebody was already caressing your daughter from since she was three years old, you're going to have a problem. Also, I wanted to point out that we cannot sit back as parents and say, HFLE, Ministry of Education, and stuff like that. As a parent, you have to constantly, especially with social media, especially with the other influences from school and other places, you have to constantly communicate with your children. You have to talk to them about their day, talk to them about their friends, talk to them about little things in school, things they watch on television. Don't wait on for the for education department to raise your child and tell your child, oh, uh, this is what sex is. No. If you constantly communicate with your child, 
like Miss Daniel wouldn't have to be like, I don't want the school to tell my child certain things because she would have already picked up. If the school is supposed to start at grade three, she might have picked up at grade one. Wow, he came home with this statement. What is that? Then she start the communication with her child, even interact with the school and let them know. Well, my son came home with this statement, you know, you know, and things like that. Communicate with the teachers constantly. Some teachers don't like to give out their cell phone numbers, but I am a boss at getting them, and I call all of them. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with most of the, the comments and some of the things that I would have responded and have already been mentioned in terms of the earlier the better and teaching about good touch, bad touch, knowledge about sexual grooming, all of those you've covered, and I fully agree. Just to respond to Alison's question about mainstreamed into teachers' responsibility or standalone. We believe that, well, I believe that it's important to have it as a standalone because what we have found is that when it's mainstreamed into the responsibilities of teachers, they tend to drop it off. And especially if they are already not convinced or comfortable in teaching it, it it's not a priority. And it's important for us to understand that HFL is about life skills. And so having persons who are trained to deliver that, I think that would make a big difference in the educational system. Thank you. I'd like to thank um, Ms. Blackstock for the presentation and um, all of you who fielded questions. I get a sense that the younger people in our society will be the ones to take this forward. Some of us older ones are so steeped in the don't talk about sex that I don't know how well we will do there. And specialization is critical because a lot of teachers don't want to talk about sex. So if it's part of their responsibility, it will get skirted around. And bright children need it too. We are seeing students coming out of A1 who are pregnant in fourth and fifth form, and that's an indication that they also need the education. Thank you very much for your time. Are we going into the next session? Yes, we are. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please, a warm round of applause for our moderator, Mrs. Ingrid Charles Gums, for our presenter, Ms. Denise Blackstock. Um, we are indeed going to our next presentation. We have one more presentation. We did have scheduled uh, Mrs. Labretta Nana Oye Hesebain, who joined us yesterday via um, a sort of a difficult Skype connection. Unfortunately, due to technological difficulties, we won't be having her joining us today. However, we will be making sure that her presentation is available as well as yesterday's presentation. However, we'll, who will be joining us um, is the senior legal counsel in the Nevis Island Administration. Ms. Rhonda Nisbet-Brown, and I'll briefly read her bio and then invite her onto the stage. Ms. Rhonda Nisbet-Brown is an individual with ambition to excel. She believes in the words of Aristotle that, quote, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence is not an act, but a habit. Her passion for excellence led her to pursue a career in teaching, where she was able to influence positively the minds of students at the Bastyr High School, her alma mater, and Charles E. Mills High School in Sandy Point, where she taught English and history. Ms. Nisbet Brown has explored communications, embracing the position of sales and marketing and a broadcaster at ZIZ. She still con contributes to national broadcasting, volunteering her expertise as a radio commentator, especially at national carnival shows. Ms. Nisbet Brown holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from UWE in Barbados. She also holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from the same university. In 2007, she received her legal education certificate from the Hugh Whitting Law School in Trinidad. Ms. Nisbet Brown is an attorney at law since October 2007. 
She has worked for several years for the government of St. Kitts and Nevis as a Crown Council Prosecutor and the Acting Director of Public Prosecutions during the year 2013. She has vast experience in the field of criminal law with commendable conviction records in a number of major violent offenses, including murder, attempted murder, robbery, wounding, burglary, shooting, abduction, rape, and other sexual offenses. She has worked with women virtual complainants in numerous sexual matters and with young girl victims, representing them in many unlawful carnal knowledge and indecent assault cases. She has done extensive pro bono legal work for the New Horizons Rehabilitation Center in St. Kitts as a counsel for the juvenile residents in the criminal division within the Magistrates Court, the High Court, and the Court of Appeal. For a few years, she worked as a part-time law lecturer at the CFBC, teaching year one Cape Law in law, legal studies, public constitutional law, and criminal law. She loves young people and is always giving of her time to mold and inspire them. She has been a litigator and an advocate for women in divorce, family, and domestic violence matters, and goes the extra mile contributing her time, effort, and resources towards women's empowerment. Ms. Nisbet Brown is a community-oriented person. She has served as a member of the Rotary Club of the Amiga and the St. Kitts and Nevis Special Olympics Board. She is currently a member of the Business and Professional Women's Club. For the past five years, she has served as the Secretary of the Council of the St. Kitts and Nevis Bar Association. Ms. Nisbet Brown currently holds the post of Senior Legal Counsel and Companies Registrar at the Legal Department in the Nevis Island Administration. As Senior Legal Counsel, she has had many opportunities to collaborate with the Ministry of Social Services and Gender Affairs, providing legal advice, representing juveniles, women, and young girls at the Magistrates Court in Nevis, and presenting at training sessions in the areas of rule of law and issues affecting men, sexual harassment in the workplace, child care, and protection under the Child Justice Act. Ms. Nisbet Brown describes herself as a highly motivated, hardworking, and well-rounded individual with a love and a passion for the law, nature, and history, as well as art. She is spiritually grounded, loves the Lord and her family, with whom she shares a tight bond. Please welcome Ms. Nisbet Brown. Thank you very much, Ms. Napier. While you were reading, I heard my name, but I was wondering who is that person. But I wish to thank you so much for um, making me sound good <laughs> in a simple way. Now, I was there sitting at my desk saying, this is so unfair because I'm the presenter before lunch. And I, the discussion before was so exciting, I know that. And I'm saying, oh, Lord, poor me. But I am going to have to impress upon you to be patient. <laughs> I think I was supposed to start at 11.30, and so we're behind schedule. But please bear with me. The information is very important and very critical to such a forum. And so protocol established, I wish each of you a pleasant good afternoon. I am certainly more than honored to be here upon the kind invitation of the Ministry of Gender and Health to address you on this topic, which is very timely and very urgent. And it's an issue that is more most dear to my heart for obvious reasons. I wish to thank the minister. I'm not seeing her. Minister Brandy Williams and her staff and her technical team for this amazing opportunity to share the stage with such an array of esteemed, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing them, esteemed, beautiful and powerful sisters. Thank you. And so allow me to indulge you for a while on an offense that is described as one of the most pervasive violations of human rights worldwide and one of the least prosecuted of all crimes. I can tell you that much being in that position to prosecute. And I'm speaking about violence against women and young girls. Is its elimination possible? The topic is eliminating violence through legal reforms and policy reforms, but is this possible? How is it possible? What kind of legal reform and policies can the government employ to remove it? Note that I did not ask if it exists for obvious reasons. So as an attorney and former prosecutor, I have had the misfortune to sit at the front line conducting many cases 
involving violence against women, from attempted murder to, to murder, you name it. Miss um, Napier mentioned a few in my bio. I have also prosecuted on behalf of young girls for unlawful carnal knowledge, or what we commonly call statutory rape. And of course, I have done some representation of women in domestic violence situations. And so, ladies and the few gentlemen, if we can pause for a moment and imagine a woman at the mature age of, say, 56, having spent a lifetime with a common law partner, is now accused of cheating when the relationship goes bad, leading him to shoot her in the head. She survives, but life has never been the same. Or imagine this woman returning from church. She goes to the kitchen and is preparing her husband's lunch when he enters the house, notably junk and disorderly as usual. He initiates a fight, begins to beat her. He picks up a knife. She runs for her life. He follows her. And when she was backed into a corner, they wrestle. Within that split second, she manages to retrieve the knife, takes a blind swing, senses return. He dies from that one knife wound. A bit grim, you may say, dramatic even, but I call this my attempt to shock each and every one of us into the reality of the impact and the existence of this type of violence and whether or not it can be eliminated by the law. So I'm inviting you to a frank discussion. For the male attendees, forgive me. I am hamstrung. This topic is about women and young girls. <laughs> and so what is violence against women and girls? For context, the UN Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women General Assembly, December 1993, describes violence against women as an act of gender-based violence that results in or is least likely to represent in physical abuse, sexual or psychological harm, suffering, including threats of coercion, deprivation of liberty, occurring in private or public. We know that violence against women is played out everywhere, in public, in the workplace to sexual harassment, but most commonly, it is closeted within the safe haven of the home. And research indicates that women are more likely to be abused, killed, or injured in a family setting. Now, I came across a very interesting theory which characterizes this violence as an inherent feature of patriarchal and capitalist systems rooted in the historical philosophy of women's subordination and inferiority to men that results in the control of their lives, bodies, and sexuality by individual men or groups of men. Now, linked to that theory is the belief that women in a relationship are inferior to their male partners, that they belong to men, and for this reason, are in the service of men and can never say no. For this reason, violence against women may include acts of sexual domination by their partners or physical attacks for withholding sex and denying their men the pleasure of a cook meal or a clean house. I prefer the view that the patriarchal belief is supported by the attitude and mindset of the very same woman who suffers. In a paper on confronting gender-based violence in the Caribbean, the Honorable Madam Justice Desiree Bernard posits that women are ambivalent about violence perpetrated by family members, more so a spouse. In marital and common law relationships, wives convince themselves that their vows are conjugal duties include occasional corporal punishment from their spouses or partners 
portrayed in Caribbean music, like in a song I came across last night by sung by um, a gentleman from Antigua called King Obstinate. You would know that name, which goes something like this. I won't try to sing it. I'm not a singer. <laughs> Darling, that's what love is all about. When I tear up your wig and bust in your ribcage, is love I love you. I became agitated just listening to the song. But I felt a lot better on, when I heard the lyrics of the offender feeling the weight of a frying pan to his head, which caused him to be rushed to the hospital. So I'm happy that in that setting, this lady was fighting back. In 2018, the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis was thrown into a dark abyss following the brutal, shocking, and violent attack on two young, beautiful sisters, Jamili and Naomi Finch, both brutally murdered, allegedly, by the male companion of sister Naomi. It sent shockwaves across the island, and for weeks, social media was abuzz with hundreds of posts in condemnation. Several groups, including the Business and Professional Women's Club, of which I am a member, vocalize its strong discontent. We were reminded that domestic violence is not just a woman's issue, but a wider socio-economic, historical, and cultural one that should compel a collective and individual action towards its immediate prevention and elimination. Sadly, two months prior to the murder of the Finch sisters, on the 21st of January 2018, the Federation, in particular Nevis, was plunged into mourning when 45-year-old Shirley Dawn Morton was killed, also allegedly at the hands of a male companion in Boxhill, Gingerland. A realistic discussion on violence against women and young girls must be premised on statistical data. What are the statistics? And what do they reveal about violence against women and girls within the Federation? Where are we on this scale? Well, thanks to the local intelligence office of the police force for its assistance in providing me with a few statistics for which I am grateful. It was like pulling teeth, though, to get the statistics. And I told one of the officers, I am going to say something about that publicly. <laughs> so forgive me. The statistics on the review received relate to domestic-related crimes for Nevis during the period 2016 to 18 for serious crimes such as homicide, attempted murder, wounding with firearm, shooting, grievously body harm, and sex-related offenses. Now we see that in 2016 and 2017, while Nevis witnessed several homicides, there was none that was domestic-related. However, in 2018, out of the five homicides, one was domestic-related, which we know was the one I just told you about. May her soul rest in peace. For sex-related offenses, during the year 2016, there were nine sex-related offenses, six in 2017 and four in 2018. Interestingly, the statistics say they were not domestic-related. Now, the positive we can deduce from these statistics is that while sex-related crimes continue to plague us, there is some slight decline from nine to six to four. Or perhaps we can hazard a guess that persons may not be reporting sex crimes. Now, the statistics for Senkit was, of course, slightly higher, and we see that for the period 2016 to 18, it shows 43 sex-related crimes offenses in 2016, 60 in 2017, three of which were domestic-related, and 33 in 2018. Again, we see the reduction. And we have to test the statistics and try and find out why, what's the reason for that. Because we don't want to give the impression that we are okay, things are good when it simply means persons are just not filing a report. Now the statistics for 2016 to 2018 
in domestic related crimes for smaller offenses um, shows that for, the, for that period, there were 276 women over 16 years and under 30 years who have been the victim of domestic related crimes, including verbal abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse, with a greater number suffering physical than verbal and sexual. There was a lowering of the numbers of, of these type of offenses for women over 30 years than those between 18 and 30. And I am thinking that it could suggest that the women over 30 years, they may not be reporting as much as those between 18 and 20. And again, I would really like to test these statistics, but I presented them to you for what it's worth. So the statistics to me are still distressing within the context of my topic, and it shows that there's greater work to be done to eliminate violence as referenced in the topic. Is elimination possible? What, if anything, though, is being done to the framework for the legal and policymakers in eradicating violence? Now, just last year, following the murder of the Finn Fin sisters, the Honorable Prime Minister, Timothy Harris, in his condemnation of the killings and violence in any form, if emphatically stated, to be clear, the government condemns violence in all its form, but we maintain that violence against women and children is most reprehensible. All may not be lost, though, for promises were made to look into amending the Domestic Violence Act and to bring about the passage of a national protocol, the subject of several years of consultation amongst key stakeholders. So what is the legal framework or policy framework which is used or can be used to eliminate in eliminating violence against women and young girls? And does the law satisfactorily addresses violence against women? Are we placing too high a burden on the law? But if not the law, what else? So I'm going to turn my attention now to the law and legal reform. Now in looking at the law, we must examine the giant, that is the sexual offenses, rape. Sexual abuse is perhaps the most frequently used weapon in the arsenal of male abusers, which preys on and affects the emotions of victims, leaving deep psychological scars. In our federation, in 2017, there were 66 sexually, sexually related offenses, over 52 in 2016. Now, the law and rape can be found in what we call the Offenses Against the Persons Act in Section 46. And it simply states that any person who is convicted of rape shall be guilty and on conviction be sentenced to life imprisonment at the discretion of the court. Now, is there anything in section 46 to deter perpetrators from committing rape against women and girls and in the process eliminating such violence? Well, let us look at it. I hear no, and I agree to a certain point, but let us look at the positive. Maybe we can say yes because of the high form of punishment being life imprisonment and that can be used as a deterrent. But notwithstanding, if we are to see a greater elimination, then all bases must be covered. And in this regard, I would suggest strongly an amendment to widen the definition of rape. That is, in my view, very myopic under the common law, because we do have to go to the common law for a definition. And rape, as we know it under the common law, I see some children here, but you know what it says, penetration of the male part into the female without consent. But I would like to see a definition that is similar to that of Barbados, for example, that defines rape in circumstances where there is force on a woman to perform 
not only vaginal sex, but oral and anal as well. Or where not only the male part, but an object not of a human body is penetrated in the woman's mouth or anus. Now this, I feel, is a modernized and aggress uh, a progressive approach to punish offenders under different scenarios, which can probably, I think, lead to greater convictions, of course, and an elimination of this type of violence. Because to leave rape, as it is expressed in section 46, is to deny victims the small comfort of having the offender receive a harsh maximum punishment of life for forceful oral or uh, anal penetration for a mere maximum punishment of 10 years for the same act deemed an indecent assault under the same offenses against the person act. And so a woman who has to suffer anal sex in a way under our law says, well, that's an indecent assault. You can only get 10 years. That is unfair. Another weakness under the Offenses Against the Person Act is the absence of a description of marital or spousal rape. And I had a discussion with my former high school teacher, Mrs. Ingrid Charlescom, about this just this morning. Now, sexual abuse or sexual spousal abuse has in recent times been the subject of open discussion and court intervention. There modern, there's a modern thinking though where there's a shift from the previous thinking that upon marriage, a woman is simply an appendage to the man. Or uh, she's property, right? And he controls her even in the sexual act. However, <coughs> Husbands can now be found guilty of raping wives in the absence of consent and where there has been, but where there has been a separation. So we have no legislation though in our law codifying that position that we rely on based on a House of Lords case in the UK, which is only of persuasive authority, it's not the law. We follow it because we follow the law of England, so to speak. And so the, perhaps the time has come in seriously considering the elimination of violence against women to look again at the Barbados sexual offense model, which expressly codifies the law that a husband can be found to have committed the offense of rape against his wife if he forces her to have sexual intercourse with him because of fear or forces her to have sexual intercourse in circumstances where they are separated. And so Mrs. Ingrid Charles was saying to me, there should not be any conditions attached to that. It should be a simple, if the husband forces himself on the wife and she doesn't consent, then that's weird. But what I was trying to explain to her is that these types of offenses are very difficult to prove in court before a jury. And so what I think is good is that the jury would hear, once they hear evidence that these two people were separated, then they may think it's unlikely that the wife consented, especially if that wife may have filed for divorce. If you see where I'm coming from, I think you understand. And so there's still a little glimmer of hope for us, but we need to go a lot further and try and progress and catch up with some of the other jurisdictions. In the Barbados Act, we see that the offense of marital rape is imprisonment for life, which is good. <laughs> Sorry, it's a prosecutor in me still. <laughs> so let's look a bit at unlawful carnal knowledge. Now, of course, we know that outside of the home, young girls, they are vulnerable to sexual assaults committed in school by teachers, etc. We just had a vibrant discussion on the whole sex, uh, um, sexual act and how we can prepare our young children 
for certain types of advances that will come upon them, believe it or not. I have done or uh, prosecuted um, unlawful carnal knowledge cases where children on a bus just going home from school, they are approached and molested, eventually leading to this grave act. So we do have to prepare our children. Now the law on unlawful carnal knowledge can be found in what we call the Criminal Law Amendment Act. Under this law, unlawful carnal knowledge with a child under 14 years or between 14 and 16 years carries a punishment of life imprisonment, which again is good. That is a strong signal or deterrent. But I found an interesting section at seven though in this piece of legislation which says that a male cohabiting with a child under the age of 16 years commits the offense, commits an offense which is punishable by imprisonment for a term not exceeding five years. It's an why I say it's interesting is because um, this section could be very useful where it may be difficult to um, lay some charges for the actual sexual act between those persons because uh, a child living in that situation can lead to a very strong <laughs> um, speculation that there's some sexual activity going on. I don't know what else a child would be living with a man in such a situation for. But at least there is a lesser offense because it is very challenging to lay charges for statutory rape, uh, especially in cases where a parent may be prostituting a child for financial gains. We are a woman bent on protecting her offending partner whom she loves and whom she knows to be sexually molesting her young girl does nothing to protect the child. And so while in these cases a woman can be charged for aiding and abetting the offense, I believe a national policy or protocol is necessary and it can be used to, to find creative view ways sorry, to address and attack these types of situations. So the national policy can be used to fill the legal gap. Now just yesterday, I got a call from one of my colleagues, of another lawyer, and she wanted some information on whether or not there's a law on what we call grooming. So that is where a male would solicit a young girl, um, try to get the young girl to send pictures of her breasts or naked body and gradually groom, as suggested by the word, groom her to the ultimate sacrifice. And I did a little bit of quick research for her and couldn't really find anything. And so again, it means that there's a lacuna in the law, that the, the law is not modernized and it's, it's not progressing with modern society. We're in the technological age, cell phones and this thing about sending pictures and so forth. And so the law has to fall in step, step by step with what is going on um, realistically. There is also a Domestic Violence Act. Is it a strong one? That is the question. I know that, yes, it helps. There isn't anything else. And it, it helps because where a woman is being uh, threatened and abused physically, even financially, then she can turn to the Domestic Violence Act for some assistance. And there are various orders that the court can grant in those circumstances called protection orders. But it is said that this piece of legislation may not help the situation. And usually when you hear that angle, it's usually because a lot of blame is placed on the persons you meet on the front line, the police you meet on the front line when reporting these type of domestic um, situations. It is often said that persons on the front line may not be as trained and may not take these type of matters seriously. And a lot of times there's reason for that. You may find a woman 
She's been battered last night. She goes to the police station because now she calls her mother or her sister and the mother and sister say, yes, come, let's go, we're gonna make a report. And they run down to the Charleston police station and the report is made. And a couple of days after, sometimes you see the woman and the man walking down the Charleston again. And so a lot of times that could be very frustrating when an officer sees that. And I can say that because I experienced that one time. However, there is a special victims unit with this special training. And I know I can commend Officer Maloney and some of the officers there for doing a splendid job in pulling up the slack. But I think, like I said, the reason may be that the training was not or hasn't been transferred to the, fir the first set of officers you see. When you, get in, when you go into the guard room. So of course, this is where a national protocol now can fill the gap so that we have a more holistic uh, representation um, that women can use. And so I, I cannot blame the law. <laughs> I, I think the, um, the legislation is there to assist women in these circumstances but the national um, protocol has to be, um, has to come on board immediately. When I did my research, I was told that there's a draft. I was not so fortunate to retrieve a copy of it. And so I think the time is now for the, the respective departments to push for that. And I know Ms. Charles again was telling me that, yes, yes, there's a draft and there's a lot of movement now to ensure that that is, is passed. Probably with your presence, Ms. Charles, <laughs> coming back to the, the Federation, you can push them to ensure that it goes up because you can see the difficulty in not having such a, a protocol. I was told that Dominica is probably the only a territory in the region that has one and it's outdated and so unfortunately my my colleague um, forgive me for just calling her Nana but we've been speaking quite a lot within the last two days unfortunately she couldn't be here but she would have been focusing quite a lot on the the national um, protocol while I did my presentation on the legal reforms but these are just things that you can think about now quickly, sexual harassment in the workplace, um, that is another um, offense that is raising its ugly head very frequently. Um, sometimes the thing with sexual harassment is that it is very difficult to identify. And it is said, particularly in the region, where, when I read this I laughed, where a touch on a woman's buttocks our sexual jokes is viewed as part of our normal social intercourse and are only treated as serious when the harassment develops into a more aggressive conduct. And so at the moment, we do not have a sexual harassment act. I think Belize has one. Um, we do not have one in any in the region. And so, of course, it means the time is right. It, the time is right for us to to um, enact a sexual harassment um, act because there are benefits to this. It means that all those conduct which may not seem like an offense can be codified into one piece of legislation and the perpetrators will know that, listen, if you touch me on my buttocks like that, <laughs> or if you say certain things, I won't even go into the whole you know, gambit of it that, that can constitute sexual harassment in the workplace. Our women need to be protected by the full arm of the law. And it is really time that the authorities to be, and men, yes, and men, because no, 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 I did a presentation right here at the Four Seasons some time ago, just quickly. And I took my male colleague with me and it was an interesting spin that he put on sexual harassment from the male perspective. And so one thank you for reminding me <laughs> that quite a large number of men experience some serious sexual harassment in the workplace. But like he said, just quickly, 
it would sound a little bit foolish for a man to go to his supervisor and say, you know, um, Rhonda told me this thing, you know, um, she, she said, I like to see how, you know, my behind look, you know, in this pant. So there is really a serious, um, serious stress <laughs> placed on the men <laughs> that is preventing them from coming forward to report sexual harassment. But it is very serious. So what can we do individually and collectively as a society? Now the eradication, or at least the reduction in the number of cases of violence against women call for an immediate and collective response. Governments, they call upon to constantly review national legislation, practices and customs and seek to abolish those that may discriminate against women. When it comes to the prosecution of offenders, for example, women must have access to the police to file a report. Now it is said, or often said, that our jurisdiction, our federation is strong. And while women may have advanced socially and economically, is that progress overshadowed by violence that needs a legal reform? Are there key areas where progress needs to be accelerated? And are we creating and strengthening partnerships within our community that contribute to the fight against violence towards women? Are the powers that be doing enough in the eradication of violence against our women, whom we consider the backbone of our society. Now in 2018, the Prime Minister promised the passage of a new Domestic Violence Act and a draft protocol. We're here in 2019. And I believe those of you who are here, who, um, has, who, who are in the position to so agitate and push should certainly do so. I'm not seeing the minister. I was going to put her on, you know, <laughs> on notice. <laughs> but we have a lot of women in here, when I look around, who have a lot of influence. And I am appealing to each and every one of you to really contribute to the dialogue and see what you can do to ensure that these pieces of legislation, important legislation, are passed. Now, March is always a beautiful month. It is the month of International Women's Day. That is when it's celebrated. I implore, and these are just my closing remarks. I skipped some because I'm mindful of the time. Don't want to torture you too much. <laughs> so I implore all of us to be mindful of our social responsibility, to be a voice for the voiceless, and to contribute to change using our resources, however scarce, to help in the elimination of violence against our women folk and young girls. The government has its role to play in strengthening the legislative framework. Sadly, behavior cannot be legislated. And I took this quote from Ms. Charles, you were presenting to the BPW last week, and I've made a note of it. <laughs> So like government, we too have a role and every opportunity ought to be used to dent the number of women victims. Your contribution may be financial. It may, it may require the use of your educational ability. You may own a business and you can employ a young or a woman victim. Or you may be able to provide pro bono legal services. I see some of my lawyer colleagues here. But whatever it is, I challenge all of us to make a difference in the lives of our sisters who are victims, and in so doing, we can become part of the solution and an agent for change. I leave these words with you today. Thank you so very much for your time.
lives of their husband or partner. That's over 800 million women worldwide. These women can feel trapped, afraid. Their lives are often restricted. Those who consider leaving often fear ending up penniless or losing their children. Over time, their confidence slips away, making a life without violence seem a distant memory. The abuse can lead to injuries, as well as serious physical and mental health problems, in some cases, even death. Many women contract sexually transmitted infections or have unwanted pregnancies, and when pregnant, have a greater risk of miscarriage or of having a premature or low birth weight baby. They can experience depression, anxiety, other mental health problems, or become addicted to drugs and alcohol. It can be hard to know whom to trust or where to turn. But there is a place they can go. A visit to a local clinic is often one of the few opportunities women have to go out alone. And it's important for doctors and nurses to make sure this isn't a missed opportunity. When doctors, nurses and midwives listen with compassion, survivors are more likely to share their story. When they ask the right questions, they can uncover what is really happening and challenge cultural attitudes that say it's okay for a husband to hit his wife. They can reassure women that it's not their fault and can work with women to help them stay safe and where necessary, connect them with other services that can provide, for example, shelter, psychological support, legal services, and financial opportunities. More women can find their way to a life without violence when changes are implemented across healthcare and other systems. Changes such as private rooms for consultations, training that enables doctors and nurses to respond better to women's needs, and raising awareness of the harmful consequences of violence for women and children and how to prevent it. Making these changes helps foster a culture where violence is unacceptable and where women have the courage to speak out. Imagine if that could happen to each and every one of those 800 million women. affects me in a big way. I'm an African woman with palm oil in my blood, and the coldness really affects me. So I apologize for that. Um, with reference to the sexual harassment legislation, I don't know if Rhonda remembers, but we tabled sexual harassment legislation about 15 years or so ago in our parliament. It had one reading, and nobody has heard about it since. And my answer to it, and I don't work for civil service anymore, so I could say what I want to say. <laughs> my feeling about that is that because sexually inappropriate behavior is almost a way of life for us, sexual harassment will be very difficult to realize passage. And uh, you could take me up on it over lunch, but I definitely feel that that's a very important piece of legislation that was tabled drafted and tabled, and no one has heard about it since, except when we raise it. Well, all I can say to that, I see the minister here, and I'm going to endeavor to try and dig it up and pull it out so that I can present it to you. That's my undertaking. OK, we see some hands over, all over the room. Thank you. I'm sorry that I missed the presentation, but I came in time to get this very important bit of information. I wasn't aware that there was something that was drafted and tabled, at, at least given a first reading. So I think that the time is opportune for us to look for it, and if we have to revise it and do an addendum, we do that and then try and move it forward, because it is important that we have that. It is important that we put something in place sooner rather than later. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. Um, very good presentation, Rhonda. I have some questions for you. Number one, you spoke, and I'm thankful that you spoke of the sexual harassment legislation that was drafted, so I guess we could look at that. But you spoke of the one in Belize. Can you give me any insight as to what are the penalties for sexual harassment looking, when you look at that legislation, as well as if it is gender neutral, because I find that your presentation was not very gender neutral. Um, so, and I, 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 gather, I gather that you said it at the beginning, but on behalf of people like X-Ray here, who also, I would imagine, have experienced sexual harassment on the job, I want to also be able to speak on his behalf and others, males, who are able to. Now, yesterday we had a presentation where we realized that the law is silent as it relates to um, consent for boys, um, for, um, sorry, consent for sexual engagement, right? Um, as a matter of fact, my learned colleague, Jianin Sinkit, said that when she researched it further, it was only in, at, in relation to buggery, but not um, the non-buggery issues. Um, so again, I was wondering, what does it say, and what are the penalties that you propose. Additionally, um, um, one of the things that I, I find that sad in Nevis in particular, think it's Nevis, but mainly Nevis, is that there are not, there are not any groups to help to push these things. So for instance, there is a, there's a 15 year passage of a, of, a, of a draft legislation that is critical, and there's no one in the government's ears or the public's ears, and not even the learned minister knows about it. That speaks to um, the fact that it appears that we want to have these conversations and then wait on government to do it. What should happen is that, and I just coined it here, I don't know if it was ever happened, a Nevis organization of women, no, and then you do things now and push things now to ensure that certain things that are needed are done now, right? And so um, I'm glad Mervyn is back so she would assist with that um, organization. But one of the things that is important is that you need to look at where, because it's one thing to keep saying, these are the gaps in legislation. My friend, Jan said she spoke to this on a presentation youth parliament in 2008. That's again 11 years ago, right? Um, well, that's the age of consent disparity with, with men. So again, what I said, can we, what's, what's important, you make the, a copy of the Belize Act, um, sorry, available so people can see at least as a draft, what's there, see what needs to be amended. You have an organization that could put pressure on the good minister to make sure that it's done now. And you have all people working together, even um, Dr. Um, I think it was Laws, as she spoke of the NCDs. Even though that information, those are things that need to be in civil society and pushed by a lot of NGOs. And so the voice um, of the NGOs is not heard on this matter. But again, Rhonda, I wanted to get from you, what are the penalties for sexual harassment, even looking at the Belize legislation? And also, who do you think should be responsible for ensuring that this legislation happens? Because if you have an organization, as I was suggesting, you could then use a couple lawyers, or even, you don't even need lawyers to draft, because all you need to do is, these are things that need to be in a legislation, and then you give to my good friend Shamika, who, who is in, skilled in drafting, and she could draft it, but there's a case of making sure that men like X-ray are protected and others, in, as well as women, in the workplace and wherever, because it is a serious crime. Yes. Okay, first of all, Rala, I must apologize because I, I cannot recall the penalties as of this moment, but I can certainly um, make the legislation available to, to um, the Department of Gender Affairs. Excuse me? What oh, what would I suggest? Well, you're asking a prosecutor at heart, eh? so. <laughs> um, no, for example, because within the Belize legislation, uh, what is being proposed um, to be included in a draft sexual harassment act is, for example, certain type of conduct that we mm -hmm. usually just brush aside mm -hmm. to, to, to become criminalized. So, for example, um, the persistence, interference, of a, a young lady on the job by her employer, where there is a sexual overtone, overtone of course, um, where the employer is asking for sexual favors um, that, can, that, that can threaten 
the, that female employee job, first of all. And so the, the legislation basically will go along those lines where we cannot see in any other piece of legislation at this point, not even in, in our Small Charges Act, that certain type of behavior is criminalized. Now, as it relates to your um, concern on how the sexual harassment piece of legislation can, can be um, revitalized, because it's somewhere, um, there has to be a search, first of all, um, to see if it can be located. We have draft models already, and you're, you're quite right, and I wish to put a plug for my good friend, which I was about to. We have our local drafters, Miss Maloney. She has a master's in legal drafting. She's used by the, the NIA, and it's just a matter of presenting that piece of legislation to Miss Maloney with the assistance of in-house, because um, maybe I can say too, we do have my colleague here, Ms. Campbell, she does some drafting as well um, for the legal department. And so there are persons available to get the work done. And thankfully the NIA recognizes and appreciates its own local people and have been using, have been using them. And so it's just a matter of finding the piece of legislation or if not, unfortunately, we'll probably just have to go uh, from scratch again. Now, as, as it relates quickly to the um, penalties for offenses against boys, I do agree, and Jeanne is quite right, that um, it is, it's sad when you look at the sexual pieces of legislation and the, the penalties for sexual offenses against boys. Because, for example, I think buggery carries something like five years Whereas indecent assault on a woman for touching her breast, for example, carries a penalty of 10 years. I know I did a presentation on this same issue some years ago. Um, I looked at some of the same pieces of legislation and the time is, is now, the time is now. We cannot continue to drag our feet any longer with these serious types of matters. Um, people are hurting and we do need to, you know, like I said, push. I don't think we have to push much further in Nevis because Minister Brandy Williams is very um, proactive and aggressive when it comes to her ministry. And so just so that you know, Minister, that, that is something you can put on your list um, and then you can consult with the legal department to see how best we can facilitate its passage. Just quickly, uh, Mervyn again, uh, during your presentation, I reflected to an article I wrote a few months ago, and it was concerning the complaint and response protocol on domestic and sexual violence. Now, that was launched in St. Kitts in November. In speaking with a few persons, that was just it. It was the launch. There was no paperwork. There was nothing else done after this wonderful launch, no report nothing. So uh, November, December, January, four months later, I don't know what the status is. But just now I actually uh, looked up for the name of it because I didn't want to get the name wrong. And then I saw an article by someone else that was written in 2012 with the same name. So a couple of years later, it's just repetition, repetition, two administrations, it's the same launch of the same protocol and nothing is being done. And uh, while I was sitting there, it, it, I remember that we don't have female representation in parliament and I guess this no. is probably, that, thanks. This is probably um, one of those draft legislations or those pieces, those policies, one of those that we as women can push for implementation um, in St. Kitts and Nevis. So it was, it was just, it was mind-boggling to me. Thank you, Ron. Right. Copyright your work, eh? Well, just briefly, um, and Ms. Charles, you did say it last week too at the same meeting that we talk a lot. Uh, we always at talk shops and we talk and we talk a good talk and then sometimes we have a little problem with execution. So it may very well be a case of that. I think I saw the same, the same paper when I did my research for this presentation as well. So, like I, I said, maybe it's just time for, for, time for action now. 
All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Delicia Julius. I am a counselor at Mental Health. And my question is in relation to mental health. We have been seeing some cases, and it's disheartening to know that the cases basically stay one place. Now, our law protects women against offenses. However, it seems when it comes to mental health, there is a lapse. Now, from what I was made to understand, if you are unable to speak in court for whatever reason, the case basically goes dormant. Now, I would like to know if there is a possibility that something can be done because our mentally ill are still a part of our society. And it is difficult to see that persons will get hurt repeatedly because nothing is being done. So I am asking you or minister or whoever to please put something in place. We are aware that the legislation in terms of mental health is outdated, needs to be worked on. But as it relates to offenses against persons, whether male or female, who has mental illness and cannot properly defend themselves or cannot properly represent themselves in court, can something be put in place? And you know what? I, I quite agree. It's a very, very good question. Because if you check even the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which, which is the law on unlawful carnal knowledge, like I say, you would see even the language in the act is so archaic. To me, it's almost disrespectful. It's not even politically correct in 2019 because it refers to a um, someone with, um, who's differently abled as an idiot, <laughs> an imbecile, an imbecile in 2019. The language itself needs to be changed. It's really, really outdated. And I think, Minister, you've been put on the spot quite a lot today, but this is your forum. We're just here to assist you, Minister, that's all. <laughs> so, yes, I agree. The time is, is right for, for us to become, not only be cognizant, because we know, but to put things in place to make the changes. Okay, and okay good I afternoon, Ms. Nisbet Brown. My name is Jessica Scarborough, and I'm from the Alexandra Hospital. Now, we are speaking legislations as well as protocols, but my concern is that persons who would have been abused one way or the other, be it physical, sexually, or even harassment in the sex place, have to go back into the community which they come from. <coughs> no, I have found that we can be very hostile and we are very um, uncouth persons, especially even our gender about each other. And with all the legislations that we may put up, all the amendments that we, can, we, we make, what are we doing about education? Because if we don't have that self-confidence, we're not going to go to the police and report that we were being sexually harassed. We're not going to go and tell them that we're being raped. And of course, I'm not going to give my public, my private business out to say that I am being abused. We are very private persons in Nevis especially, and I think Mrs. Daniel spoke to that earlier today. And I would not want the whole community to know what I'm going through. That's my first point. My second point is, um, in terms of teenage pregnancy, and I'm speaking about teenagers below the age of consent. Now, we have seen persons coming in 14, sometimes, you know, very few cases, 13 years old, pregnant. And nobody has been made responsible for these young kids who are being pregnant. We have children getting children. And as a result of that, there is a big breakdown in our community in terms of raising your child. Now, your grandparents, your mothers, our mothers for these 13-year-olds, may only be in their late 20s, but they are forced to raise grandchildren. No. I cannot recall, and I could be corrected if anybody knows differently, I can't recall ever hearing that any males who may have impregnated these young persons would have been held accountable. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you stated that there's um, a life, up to life imprisonment for years. But I have not even heard a one-year sentence for anybody being charged. Now, what can we do about that? Can the parents be held responsible 
in terms of bringing these cases to the fore as well too. Because I know several times, and it is our belief under the table that parents also um, cohorts with this mayor in terms of covering up these pregnancies and who they are for. Is there anything in the books that we can do about that? Thank you. Okay, we will just take about two or three more questions. We're asking if you can keep them as concise as possible. If they're concise, we can fit a few more in. And uh, well, I tend to disagree slightly. The, um, the law is there to hold people, uh, offenders, accountable for their offending behavior. I know I've prosecuted quite a number of cases involving children where there has been um, convictions secure. Um, I can't recall at this moment, though, anywhere um, the victim may have become pregnant. But, of course, we do get convictions all, all the time. Now, I must admit, though, it's very difficult to secure a conviction for unlawful carnal knowledge. It's very distressing because a lot of times you have a, a jury, 12 big men and women, and sometimes the comments you hear from the big men and women about this young girl who is under 16, oh, she, she, out, she out long time, but she's a wild girl, she hot. What's she coming with? She, she out there long time. I have heard that myself. And so maybe it's, it's also time for the adults, the big people, to change their attitude towards young girls. Once you're under 16, the law says you cannot consent. You don't know what sex is all about in the eyes of the law. For so me. The next time you're picked to, you're, you're, you're called upon, the next time you're called upon, as a, as a juror, please remember that, okay? They're children. Okay. For me, just one second, Miss, Miss Napier, I just want to commend the young lady over there who spoke a while ago, Marva, Mervan, I just want to commend you, Mervan, for your spirit, for your all that you have. I see you as that person who is going to lead. I move things forward. I'm here. I'm right behind you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, that's my former student. So let me pull a little. <laughs> um, okay. Shall I go? Um, so uh, my question is, so this relates to the special victims unit. Um, someone close to me, again, um, she broke up with her boyfriend, right, in January. And not too long after they broke up, he started threatening her, like sending her photos of gun and telling her, if I see you with any other guy, it's going to be me and you and him, right? And so I, you know, I work in the department, so I asked them about the special victims. You know, I got the number and I gave it to her, and she, like, she, was, she wasn't moving on it. So I asked her, you want me to call special victims unit with you? And she said, Sure. So when we called them, um, we were explaining the situation to the person on the phone, because it's a 24-hour um, hotline. And the response we got was, because he's no longer living with her, they can't do anything. So, but the, the thing about it, what made, what is so, doesn't seem to write about it is the fact that this happened, this, the breakup happened in early January. We call them less than a month, I'll say a month the most later. And not because they're not living together. He actually broke into the house. So how do you... I feel as though special victims you know, should be able to do something still. Maybe not because they're not living together. Maybe a time frame or something should be put in place. So um, I'm just wondering, what is your opinion on that? And the other one, too... There is, I know we're not talking about, um, well, at this point, we weren't talking about guys or anything like that, but in, with respect to gender-based violence on a whole, at the, the first national youth consultation that was held a few weeks ago, 
there was a there was a whole lot of young persons, hundreds of them, with the all the ministers lined up, and they asked the ministers all sorts of questions. And one person stood up and asked. He said, "You know, it's all well and good that the law is protecting women if um, you know her boyfriend, husband puts his hand on her. But what if a man comes to the police, goes to the police to report that his boyfriend hit him?" How do we approach that? Because his point is that his point is that a lot of persons this happens, and persons are not coming out and saying it because they're afraid that the police will lock them up instead of the person who has assaulted them. And so the two ministers got up and they gave I wouldn't say who, but two ministers got up and they they gave their piece and they. You know, they gave answers re reflecting, you know, well, whoever did the wrong will, should be persecuted um, and should go to jail. But um, my question to you is, how true, not saying I don't believe them, but how true is that if a young man goes to report that he's been abused by his boyfriend, will, he, will the case be actually taken on seriously and he not be charged with buggery? And also, to I want to comment on this, um, Mervan. I want to comment on the launch that you talked about in November. I think that was just a consultation. It wasn't actually the launch of an actual um, document of entry of sort. The name is what, in my opinion, is what threw it off. That's why. Because when I found out it was just a consultation, so it was just with stakeholders coming together so that they could actually make the actual, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, but um, to to respond to what you have just said, just quickly, <laughs> um, oh God, no. what was done between the two guys and the young lady as well? Those are offenses that are that are already covered under the law. I, from what you have said, I I got, and if I was the police, I would be charging for the threatening language for an assault and battery, maybe for wounding. It's all there in the law. And I think I made a point that I got from Ms. Charles that we cannot legislate behavior. And that is where the, the, the national protocol would become very critical and relevant because it would address the way in which the police respond, what the attitude should be. If a complaint is made to the police and the police doesn't do anything about it, what could be the consequences of that, etc., etc. So the law is there, the law is there, but it does need the, the protocol to be able to support that. Yeah, Harvey Hendrickson, I hope this is, thanks for the opportunity. If you were to subtract 36 years from 19, um, from, nine, from 2007, go back, and assume your age, all those years I would have put in as a police officer within the length and breadth of St. Kitts and Nevis. And all of the offenses and the crimes that you have, you have indicated, I have dealt with all of them. And so I have first-hand knowledge of all of these, of these crimes. Now, we are sometimes in a difficult position. But to go very quickly because of the lunchtime, I will say that a lot of times... People, the complainant, after you have recorded a statement from them, you have taken the report, recorded the statement, and you are moving forward. They come back and they tell you, police, I mean, I want to go no further with this thing, you know. <laughs> and you tell them, what's stupid is it? Because you have lost time as a police officer in the night going and looking for people. And they come tell you this foolish thing. You see where we are? Not only that, there are also times when a juvenile is involved. And in investigating the matter, you, rec you, you find that the mother is benefiting in a real way. And I know of cases where the mother, who is supposed to support the child, just suddenly disappear, leave the island and go on, or go into hiding. You don't see them. 
And when you do find them someplace, I me mean, don't remember what you talk about, you know. Me can't remember nothing. So it is those situations that we have that causes sometimes the matters not to go forward. And I want to say, I know you would have indicated that is women's thing. But again, I have dealt with man thing too. You know? And we have to be very careful. And, and in terms of the legislation, it is full time because there are a lot of other things they can speak to in terms of legislation. But in reference to this particular matter, it is full time for the the legal fraternity, as it were, in St. Kitts is proper, to look at the laws and revise them and upgrade them as to current affairs, yes, the current things yes. that are happening. It is yes. very important. And I, not sit down on them. We have spoken to that so many times mm -hmm. before, and nothing seemingly has been done. Thank you. Yes, thank you so very much. Um, you've made some profound points, um, points that I did Sorry. try to touch a bit on in my presentation. And like I said, points that the notes were taken, the minister is here, and these are things we can take forward. Um, okay, before we go, I, just a I, quick comment. I, Victim. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, um, you can make your point very quickly. Yeah. Victim um, protection. And I have a meeting at 2 o'clock. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Victim protection is important. I mean, as a doctor, they come to us, and you want to do tests, but they become exposed in the chain of evaluation. And the only testing modality which has some preservation of confidentiality is the HIV testing where there's no name being put forward. So there's some, you know, but when you do tests for the other STDs and so on, the lab insists that you put a name on the request form, and like that, which is a problem. And the patient just disappears. After you get a new request, they disappear. Same thing with prescriptions. I've had to go to the pharmacy to get prescription for patients just to treat them for their presumed infectious without proper testing because they go, they go, they go to the pharmacy and they're exposed well, or you're being treated for this and for that. So these are real issues that we face in a small society, and we need to have some robust protocol in place to protect these victims from further exposure. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to thank Ms. Rhonda Nisbet-Brown very much, as well as our esteemed moderator. Let's give them both a round of applause. Um, I just do have a few very brief housekeeping matters. St. Kitts delegates, the bus will leave Four Seasons at 4.15 p.m. promptly. Carib Surf will leave at 5 o'clock p.m. Overseas delegates, just a reminder that the bus leaves Mount Nevis at 8.15 a.m. sharp. Lunch today will be served in the Hamilton, which is upstairs. And we will try to resume within 40 minutes. So by 5 past 2, let's all be back here and ready to go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>